Well, you know, it's been an interesting season for all of us. This is the, this is the first Easter we've had like this, isn't it? And hopefully the last. But um, for me, uh, the interesting part in all of this is I've had different messages prepared for uh, these coming Sundays, and I can say to you, almost every one has been <laughs> changed. <laughs> so you know what? Um, I'm glad God, the Lord got me on the right gospel lesson today because um, that's what my message is about this weekend. And before I uh, share that message with you, I want to share with you, recently I had a birthday, and I got some different cards from people. And one of the cards I had uh, received really ties into my message today. And on the front of the card is a picture of a police officer writing a ticket to a priest. And he says, uh, Reverend, have you been drinking? And he replies, just water, officer. Then why do I smell wine, the officer replied. And the priest resp responds, good Lord, he's done it again. <laughs> my favorite card, my favorite birthday card to receive. I'll probably receive 20 of these next year. But you know what? Um, that speaks to the reality of the miraculous in each one of our lives. And as we gather together today, this Easter Sunday in 2020, we continue to believe God for a miracle in many different ways. Uh, we have been praying for that over this past week, as I believe Christians have throughout the world, that God would move in a very sovereign way to allow this modern day plague to literally pass over us more quickly rather than later. Uh, that the numbers would drop, that people would be healed in a miraculous way with the Lord, that the Lord would bless uh, those who are working on uh, cures and medicines for this, and that God's touch would be upon us in this hour and be present to us. Um, as I've shared, we've been in a season of incredible fasting. It's been the most lentiest Lent that any of us have been through. And we've been fasting from things that we weren't planning on fasting from, like in a way, fasting from being together in church and social gatherings, fasting from security in our world, uh, and having more solitude than any of us could ever imagine. Um, and yet in that, I think, has been an invitation in the midst of the shaking of our world to draw closer to our Lord in faith and in prayer, to understand that our lives need to be firmly built on him in a very real and powerful way. And the truth is, this has been the message to the church from the very beginning, even on this first Easter morning. You know, the Easter miracle that you and I celebrate is that when they went to the tomb that first Easter morning, Jesus was not in the tomb. Uh, because as we understand, he had risen from the dead. But do you realize that when they went to Easter that first Easter morning, they were going to that tomb expecting to find a dead body. In fact, in some of the accounts, you'll read stories of the women coming and actually having spices to anoint the body uh, on that third day. So they were fully expecting, as Mary Magdalene went early to the tomb that morning when it was still dark, she was expecting to come to the place where her, the body of her Lord was laid. Um, and you'll notice that this is the case from her words. Notice the words that she said when she sees the stone rolled away from the tomb. She goes back to Peter and John and she says to them, they have taken our Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So again, her words, she's shocked that he's not in the tomb. She thinks somebody's robbed his body. She goes back to the disciples, runs all the way back and says, they've taken the Lord and I don't know where he's at. And she's exasperated. Then the story goes, the other disciples run to the tomb. And yeah, he's gone. And what did, the, what did the other two disciples do? They go back home. All right, well, you don't know where he's at. They go back home. But Mary doesn't do that. And the interesting thing about this particular gospel reading, as much as this is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it is that, I believe it's also a story about Mary. A very powerful story about Mary. And I believe it's a story about you and me. As much as you and I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on this Easter Sunday, and we have that focus, and we worship him, and we praise him, and we bless him, in a way, this Easter is unique and special because I think the Lord wants to turn his attention to us and where we are in relationship to him. Mary starts to cry at the tomb. She begins to weep uncontrollably because she can't find the Lord's body. And 
and she wants to honor him in a very special way, and this is breaking her heart. And as she is crying, there are a couple of angels that appear in the tomb. Now, again, in a way, this doesn't really get Mary's attention. Notice it from the story. She doesn't fall to the ground in fear. It's almost like the angels are a side note to her. She's so overwhelmed with grief about her Lord's missing body, not being able to find him. And the angels, and also a gardener who shows up in the story, ask her the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? Now, I've shared with you before, and I'll share with you here, here again today, when an angel or when the Lord asks you a question, it's not because they're looking for the answer. They already know what the answer is. They ask you a question in order to invite you to a deeper place in the Lord and in your spiritual journey. Woman, why are you weeping? Why are you crying at this empty tomb? And again, she says, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. The second time she says this, and then the gardener who's around there, who she thinks is a gardener, she says to him, sir, if you've removed him, tell me where you've put him, and I'll take him away. Again, what is Mary's focus? Her focus is on Jesus and his body and honoring him and, and basically getting him back in the tomb and making sure that nothing else horrible happens to him. So you see, this is Mary Magdalene's drive on that first Easter morning. Um, do you notice kind of the irony of this whole story? Here we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and on that first Easter morning, we have Mary Magdalene looking for his body. <laughs> because as it says in the story, they did not understand that he was supposed to rise from the dead. Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons delivered out of her by the Lord Jesus Christ, who in some of the stories about her was a prostitute, who literally in the depth of her life was saved and transformed and throughout the rest of her life had never experienced the love of anyone so powerfully and so transformingly as she did in the person of Jesus. That's why even though for her in this moment, he is dead in a very real way, he is very much still alive in her heart. She treasures the memories. She tre treasures the deliverance. She treasures the love flowing from his eyes to her. She treasures the times of miracles and the wondrous, wondrous things that her Lord did for her. And all of these are treasures that have been stored up in her heart, and that's why she weeps. Mary is passionate about Jesus and wants to honor him. That's why she has not left the tomb and she will not leave the tomb until what? Until she finds the body of Jesus. She is a, a woman on a mission. Like uh, at the blue light special at Kmart, don't even get around that table when the blue light gets off. Gets off. I just stay away, let them get in there and get what they want and I kind of get what's left. Uh, Mary Magdalene is on a mission and that is to find the body of Jesus. I wish and I pray for our church and the church worldwide that we would be as passionate and hungry and tenacious at about, about our relationship with the risen Jesus and the risen Christ as Mary was trying to find her dead Lord's body. I would settle for that. I would be happy with that. That would be a huge transformation that would hit not only our church, but the church in the world as well. Could you imagine a church as passionate and as tenacious as Mary Magdalene, seeking after the Lord, doing whatever she had to do, crying and weeping and not moving from that place until she found the body of her Lord. That's the kind of passion we need in our church in this hour. And then... She hears the word that will again forever change her life. Mary. That's all he says. He simply says her name. Mary. Goosebumps. Electricity. Emotional touch. 
a spiritual wave. I know that voice. And he's not a gardener. <laughs> and so you see from the story, she's overwhelmed. She just, again, probably is a, a, a bowl full of tears now at the feet of her Lord. I can just imagine the sh a scene. She's grabbing old, a hold of him. He, she's not going to let him go. I found you and you're alive of all things. That's why he says, do not lay hold of me. <laughs> Because I haven't ascended yet. She's already grabbed a hold of him. He's not going anywhere. She's grabbed a hold of Jesus. And he's not going anywhere. Again, see the passion. Feel the passion. Feel the, oh my Lord, I'm not going to let you leave me. That's what we need in our lives in this church, in this moment, in relationship with the, with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. She goes back to the disciples who went home and missed the miracle, missed the garden. You know what? There's something about crying before the Lord. There's something about weeping before him. There's something about being passionate about him instead of going home and going back to bed. Like the other two disciples did. Mary stayed. Mary persevered. Mary wept. Mary wanted the Lord more than anything else in the world. And she was the first one to see the risen Jesus. And she'll be telling that story all the way through eternity. She goes back to the disciples, who are probably already back in bed. She wakes them up again. They're saying, what is she doing bothering us, this woman again? And what does she say to them? I have seen the Lord. I mean, she's, she's, she's walking on air. She didn't even run back. She just flew, flew back. She just glided on air. I have seen the Lord. And for the second time in Mary's life, her world has been turned upside down. The first time was, was when she came to the Lord. She was delivered from evil. She walked with him while he was upon the earth. That was the first time her world was turned upside down. The second time was seeing the risen Christ. And the spirit within her and the disciples, as they would see Jesus later on in the upper room, and as they would go out into Pentecost and receive the fullness in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God would use them to shake the world and turn the world upside down. Beloved, however you want to look at this present moment in terms of what we're going through, we can honestly say this, our world has been shaken in a very literal way, in a way like none of us have ever experienced. Our world has been shaken. And I will simply say this, I believe God is using this moment in the lives of his people to get our attention. I've been saying this now for a number of weeks that the, God wants us to understand that he wants us firmly rooted and planted in him. And also the Lord wants us to learn from the story of Mary Magdalene this day. Because the story of Mary on this Resurrection Sunday is your story and it's my story. And the story is simply this. Are you going to be passionate about the Lord? Are you going to get off of the sidelines and get out of your bed and tarry with him and cry for him and want him and love him more than anyone and anything in your life? What else can God do than what he has done over the past few weeks to bring us to this pr present situation and pretty much strip as much out of his life as he our lives as he possibly could and give us the opportunity to be with him more deeply and more profoundly. I would encourage you in the days to come, however much, much time we have left in this season, to not fill it of watching binge watching on TV <laughs> or going out and trying to figure out how you're gonna occupy your time, how you're gonna fill it up, going on your umpteenth walk of the day, but I want to encourage you, at least during the time that we have left in this season, to be with him. To join me in prayer that, Lord, that you would give us the heart of a Mary Magdalene that is passionate for you, that weeps for you, that cries for you, that wants you more than anything else in our lives. And may the time that we're going through right now be the second shaking in our lives, too. May this literally be not only the turning upside down of our world as we've known it at this point, 
But my prayer is, and it continues to be, Lord, unless we emerge on the other side of this different into repentance and revival and a transformation in our culture, I don't want you to let us out of this time yet because we're not ready. It will have all been a waste. Because I believe God can use this for a tremendous spiritual transformation in our lives and in the lives of our culture, and that is exactly what we need. Exactly what we need in this hour. And so be open to that in your life. Pray for that in this world, in this moment, that people would not medicate themselves or fill their time up with a lot of other things, but allow the Lord Jesus to show up for them and to say their name, to speak their name in a way that will touch them and will change them for all of eternity. I have seen the Lord. <laughs> I have seen the Lord. And the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.